Hello and welcome to Colonial Outcast. It is currently Monday night, Tuesday morning, August 5th, 6th, depending on where you live. And this is a speed post episode because this news cycle has been insane over the past few days. White nationalist riots in London, a contentious election drama still unfolding in Venezuela, an apparent overthrow, at least temporarily, of the Bangladeshi government. And the Iran-Israel tensions are escalating to a boiling point where a wider conflict that could engulf the entire region is more likely now than it have, has been. And this episode can become irrelevant at any moment because that's just how things are now. Welcome to 2024. It's going to get worse before it gets worse. So we're going to focus on this later issue, you know, the regional war on this episode to resurrect a dormant segment that we have operational breakdown. Yeah, you guys may have missed this one, where we approach everything simply from a military angle in an attempt to make very important operational and tactical knowledge accessible to the non-military global citizenry who wish to be informed. So my name is Greg Stoker. I'm a former U.S. Army Ranger who now does geopolitical commentary for such dirty leftist outlets at like TRT World and Mint Press News. And I'm joined tonight by a returning friend of the show, Jay Alfred, former 10-year Air Force uh, security forces veteran who's had some experience in special operations forces and methodology, and he knows way more than me about aircraft ordnance being a part of the Air Force, uh, and he's more directly plugged in to what is going on in the military and in Washington than I am currently. So thank you, Jay Alfred, for coming on. Sure. Thanks a lot. Yes. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I think that the last 72 hours have been just a massive, massive, massive information load and things are happening faster than we can process. And right now, the processing of the information, the way I'm looking at it is there's an absolute danger that the United States has just engaged itself in. Um, what's not getting reported openly is that from Whiteman Air Force Base, a B-2 spirit has left the nest and has landed in the region uh, yeah specifically, so specifically in qatar yeah so real quick i think we we do have some footage that was um pulled so let's play it and you can tell us what the hell is a two billion dollar stealth bomber doing over there so here here's i pulled this from a zionist telegram channel So uh, there we have it. Uh, so can you tell us why, um, uh, you know, this uh, two billion dollar B two stealth bomber has just landed in Qatar? What do you think's going on here? Is it significant? Potentially insane. So it's absolutely insane. It's absolute insanity. Um, for to crystallize it for people, for the better part of twenty, thirty years, essentially. Bibi Netanyahu has made this, this proclamation that Iran is on a breakout level to achieve nuclear weapons. He did it in 1990. He did it in 98, 2001, 2004. And he's done it every single year emphatically. And despite the fact that Iran is a signatory of the NPT, non uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and Israel is not, it is absolutely weird that the country that you're claiming is going to get nuclear weapons um, has not achieved them as we know of yet. Now, he has used this as an impetus to be able to say that the United States should strike Iran and it should topple its regime and um, Iran cannot be allowed to get nuclear weapons. Well, in this case, um, as we all know, with Soleimani uh, being, or yes, with Qasem Soleimani being killed in Iran, um, in Iraq specifically, and then when you look at um, the Hamas political leader that was just assassinated in Iran, the fact that Bibi came here a couple of weeks ago and he lobbied for greater war within the region, the B-2 flying is incredibly significant. That plane does not leave the continental United States for an air show. It leaves specifically to drop bombs on target. Its payload, it could hold anywhere from 10 to 15 JDAMs, 2,000 pound bombs, and it flies at, a, at an altitude of almost 60 to 70,000 feet. 
and the speed and the kinetic energy of which it drops its weapon or its payload is has it has a devastating effect. So an F-16 or an F-15 dropping a 2,000 pound bomb from 10,000 feet, it is devastating. But when a B-2 does it, it's massively devastating. And in this case, a B-2 is specifically designed to deliver a nuclear armed payload. So the fact that you have an entire naval armada that was sent in the USS, um, the USS Lincoln, or uh, I believe it's the it is the Lincoln. There's over 1,500 uh, Marines that are on on station that can forward deploy at any moment from that ship to be able to respond. And then you have whether it be the First Ranger Battalion, Greg, as you know, or mm -hmm. um, any one of the Ranger contingency units, they could be wheels up within 48 to 72 hours and landing. Uh, where they need to and be able to conduct operations. So there's a level of standoff, but more importantly, the B-2 landing in the region where it did in Qatar, it shows that a possible strike against Iran using nuclear armed weapons is very much an option and it's on the table. Because again, that aircraft, it does not have any standoff weapons. There are no guns, there are no missiles. It is specifically designed to drop a bomb, specifically a nuclear armed weapon. So, right, and the isn't, United isn't, States. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Isn't isn't Whitman Air Force Base a nuclear hub? Isn't that where yeah. nukes are housed? Yeah, correct. So there's multiple PRP, what what are called typically PRP bases, um, and that's the added level of security that all personnel that are stationed there have to go through because you are on a base that houses nuclear weapons. Um, so specifically uh, within the security forces contingents, uh, for example, at F.E. Warren in Wyoming, you have Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. Um, you have uh, specifically uh, those bases that are responsible for holding the Trident missiles that are responsible for holding your Patriot missile batteries and all your other nuclear armed missiles. Those bases, you know, they'll launch from their silos. But Whiteman specifically has the capability to arm a B-2 or a stealth fighter, send it in the air, and within 24 hours, it's anywhere around the world that, that you need it to deliver that payload. And the fact that it's landing into Qatar with potentially a nuclear armed payload, it sends a direct message to the Iranians that we are not playing around and we will potentially launch. And I think that the, the, the bigger message is not necessarily to Iran, but it's to China. And the most destructive thing that we need to look at is that the United States is a fleeting empire. What happens to an animal when you corner it? An animal which is cornered will lash out forcefully and, for, and vociferously to be able to show the threat that you better back away. So I think that this move is more so to let the Chinese know that we are not, we are not removing nuclear weapons from the table. We are very much including it on the calculus and how you act in the North, in the, in the North China Sea is going to matter. I would argue, though, it's also about Russia, too, because Russia has done something very significant today as well. So just, just to kind of outline what that is, um, so a senior ally today, uh, this is Monday, uh, maybe it's tomorrow for you, of President Vladimir Putin arrived in Tehran today for talks with Iranian leaders, including the president and top security officials, as the Islamic Republic weighs its response to the killing of Hamas le uh, leader Ismail Haniyeh. Sergei Shiogu, um, Secretary of Russia's Security Council, was shown by Russia's Zvezda television station meeting with Rear Admiral Ali Akbar Ahmadian, a senior Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps commander who serves as Secretary of the Supreme National Security Council. This is a pretty bold move, meeting peer-to-peer -peer for such high-ranking security officials, considering the timing of everything. There's also social media moves that he flew in with, uh, sorry, not moves, rumors. Uh, I haven't been able to confirm this, uh, so this is just speculation. He also flew in with a couple planes worth of um, EW, electronic warfare equipment, potentially meant to uh, deter and uh, undermine U.S. targeting capabilities of Iranian hard sites in the region. Those do take a few days to set up, and it's not even confirmed. There's something to keep in mind. Um but it's a bold move uh, because it that's like visibly deepening in a very significant way on the international diplomatic scene that Russia and Iran are 
uh, strengthening their security alliance. So there's also, um, yeah. Uh, so that, that's it's just not just China; it's Russia too. It, it absolutely is. And when I speak with the when I speak about the Chinese very much, I speak about them in the sense of the geopolitical aspect that they are very much aligned with the with the with the Russians, as it was said recently by one mm -hmm. of their foreign ministers that they plan that there is no daylight between that relationship and they plan to stand by the Russians through through hell or high water. When you look at the way that those axes are aligning and you look at the fact that, well, if you're the Chinese or if you're the Russians, you don't need to send an armada across the ocean. You, you just don't need to do that. You can literally just arm your enemies, as Vladimir Putin said very clearly, we are going to arm your enemies the way you armed ours. And at the end of the day, the receiving end of this is going to be the Israeli population. And my, my one hope is that the Iranians decide from a tactical standpoint, you know, because there are two wars that you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight the PR war, which is very, very important. But you're also going to have to find the, fight the ground war. I'm hoping that instead of striking Israel proper and laying siege or, or you know, just causing massive numbers of casualties, I think that they need to exact justice. I think that in order to bring calm to the region, it, it needs to be some sort of Archduke assassination type of approach where somebody like Bibi goes down. It would bring justice that the Palestinians direly deserve, and it would hopefully send notice to the Israeli delegation within Israel proper that this has the very, very severe capability to cost me my life if I continue this. And you have a potential so-called moderate, uh, even though I don't think that he's that, in Golan, which is the Israeli defense minister, who has indicated an end to, that he wants an end to hostilities as he sees it right now, because it's counterproductive to Israel. And they are, they're, not, they're just not winning. So there's that. So hopefully the Iranians practice detente to a certain extent. But if they do decide to strike, I hope it's directly at the heart of the, of the beast himself, which is, which is Bibi. Yeah, and we'll get into that right now, whether or not they have the capability, uh, uh, in a minute, whether or not they have the capabilities for that. But I just wanted to bring up, because everything's breaking right now uh, in terms of news. So a few hours ago, because um, it's not just Iran at play. You know, there's Hezbollah, there's Yemen, there, there's more powerful actors, and there's less powerful actors in Iraq, the popular resistance forces, the militias in that region, um, who maybe don't have the same relationship with Iran, where Iran doesn't have the same amount of influence on what they do and their day-to-day -day operations, I have one concern going forward. So a few hours ago, Iraqi militias, TBD, it's probably Kitab Hezbollah, I bet, um, hit the U.S. al-Assad airbase in Iraq, which was an escalation from an Iran-affiliated resistance forces that I personally didn't expect. So a major concern is that they'll go rogue and force a U.S.-Iran escalation that neither government seems to want. You know, one point of consideration here is that the entire legality, too, I just want to bring this up real quick, behind the U.S. bases in Iraq at this stage as they, uh, is in question because they have been requested by the Iraqi government to leave. Um, the last thing that the U.S. needs is to attract more attention to itself in that manner, as the bases in Iraq are another issue of contestation. Plus, their air defense systems could easily be overwhelmed by Iranian ordnance if this thing goes off. And again, one thing about the bases, too, that I don't think the U.S. wants to escalate over this attack is we don't know the details. Second, uh, there's been a lot of bad PR, like they had to pull out of Niger. What was the air base there? Agadez. Um, mm -hmm. and, and like, if this becomes a trend and if it, um, uh, of a, there's a lot of benefits that a country gets from having a U.S. base that we don't really need to get into. But if if the costs start outweighing the benefits, we're going to see a drawdown in U.S. imperialism, imperium power, imperial power with, you know, all these bases starting to go. So I don't think they're going to make a huge issue out of this attack. But my concern going forward is like one of these Iranian proxies might um, go rogue or Israel let's be honest, probably more likely of going rogue to kind of mess up this de-escalation game that's happening right now. So this is a situation where once the toothpaste is out, there's no bringing it back in. Mm -hmm. The Iraqis have 20 years of battle-tested fighters mm -hmm. that have been in the thick 
and they have one common one common synergy with the Iranians. They both have a pound of flesh that they need to exact from the Israelis. The Iraqis, if you talk to any Iraqi, whether it's in Michigan or New York, they'll tell you flat out that the reason Iraq is in the condition that it's in is partly and in total because of the Israelis. Again, the distinction is between the Israeli and the Israeli government, the government specifically. And again, 20 years of battle-hardened fighters being armed directly from not only the Iraqi government, but also the Iranian government, crossing over through Syria, picking up fighters there, coming down from the north into Lebanon, crossing the Natanz, and waging total land and guerrilla warfare. Jordan will fall. Sisi will have a choice. He either carries the line and allows fighters to fight covertly, or he loses his presidency and he loses his dictatorship control. Because what's the good of a billion dollars if you're not alive to spend it? Again, it's not speaking positively of Sisi at all. It's just speaking to the geopolitical aspects. And then again, you have the Turks, who they absolutely, in Ankara, Ankara will burn if Erdogan does not enter this war to support Palestine in some way, shape, or form, whether it's at the humanitarian level or whether it's at the kinetic level. And if I'm advising Erdogan, I would say provide support at the humanitarian level because at least that'll give you shade and cover to not be able to send in ground forces at a kinetic level. It gives you the, it gives you the, the illusion of neutrality because at this point, you're going to have a choice between your presidency and control of your government or the violation of your NATO agreement. Because remember, when one nation, when one NATO nation goes to war, all others must support it. And that is not a diplomatic melee that the United States wants to have to deal with because you would void all international treaties, which again, the United States is very common for doing, but it would be bold faced, just a pure slap in NATO's face. And they would give impetus to all the other NATO nations, for example, um, like the Ukraine, who's talking about joining for protection. Well, if that's the case, if you're not willing to support other NATO members, why should we believe that you'll support us? The Swiss, for example, who have longstanding neutrality, what gives you the, what gives you the idea that you'll support us? It, it's something that the United States, who, in my opinion, is not in a position to negotiate with, because who do we have? We have somebody like Blinken. That's our that's our top diplomat. I mean, Blinken is very clearly outclassed by his counterparts in Russia, uh, like Lavrov, and his counterparts in in China. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that you know the, the the geopolitical ramifications of an escalation are um, kind of so complex and unfathomable that like you can't even really make it. But, like this is this is like a like a world war style inflection point. I hate to use the term because I don't think it's going to happen yet. But yeah, just a massive global upheaval. Um, in there terms is of systems. There is only one way that you can escape this without kinetic action, and the only country that can change it is Saudi Arabia. It changed it in the seventies, and it cost him his life. That's why he won't do it. That's why he, he'll learn his, the lesson from his grandfather. But if bin Salman were to cut the oil off to the United States, it would cause the United States to say to Israel, enough. Flat out. Because, again, if I'm Saudi Arabia, I have the Houthis to my south. I have the Iraqis and the Iranians now aligned. I have the Syrians Jordan will fall. Guaranteed Jordan falls. What's next? They will burn that man out of his ivory tower very easily. So he has a very clear choice. He can put his foot down and, and bring an end to this, but he won't do it. And there's a reason why I don't necessarily know, but he has the absolute power to be able to bring the United States to atone and say enough is enough. If you don't do this, if you do not end this belligerence, we will cut production. We will send oil to $250 a barrel if need be. 
They win no matter what. They win no matter what. Where where else are you going to go? You know, this so, is an this is an interesting thing to bring up. It was something I was just talking about on on my Mint Press show about an hour ago. It's it's like the Saudis don't even need to do that. One of the big factors in de escalation is like what happens if the Strait of Hormuz gets shut down uh, because of a war with with Iran. That's where one fifth of the world's oil passes through. So, um, you know, you, you don't like your, the price of gas and groceries right now. It's like, yeah, the United States has massive oil reserves. Um, uh, what, what's it going to do to Europe though, who refuses at this moment, Russian oil, you know, what, uh, U S is not going to, going to have to use its own reserves. And if you don't like your gas prices and your grocery prices and your global supply chain prices right now, well, guess what? You're going to hate a freaking war with Iran. So, you know, I, I don't think we were, we're, when we talk about that de de-escalation, there's, there's a reason it's not because war hawks within the United States government don't exist or, or in Whitehall don't exist or in the European Union, they don't exist. No, they absolutely do. However, there's an entire state and defense apparatus that knows we're not prepared to fight a regional major conflict. They just said that in front of Congress in an official report. Um, and also, the United States public, as a polity, is not prepared to fight a massive war. Like, I don't think they have the tolerance for it, the narrative like we didn't have a 9/11 over this. They're not willing to go and fight and die for Israel and, you know, sacrifice their comfort for a foreign war, the dimensions of which they don't even understand. So that's why this de-escalation game I think is happening right we're now. We're having a we're having a fundamental problem just recruiting for basic numbers. Mm -hmm. So I fail to understand how and the assessment is correct that we are not prepared for a large protracted war. But I fail to understand how you go up against the Chinese, the PLA, with what is essentially a million man army. Then you have the Russians who, for the last three years, have been engaged in trench warfare, very, gaining massive amounts of experience on top of that. You have a calcified military because, again, the guys that I, was, that I served with, we're all transitioning out. The guys mm -hmm. who fought in the GWAT that were actively engaged in on La Seria, that were actively engaged in biop in those areas, we're transitioning out. We're 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 fleeting we're fleeting out. And what are we being left with? The pink yeah. warrior brigade who, who are putting fucking nail polish on their fingers. I right. can see how, and, how we have the hard men ready to fight in this type of war. Well, it's it's not even the it's not even the combat experience. I mean, it's not even like it's just basic combat experience as well, because like I'm going to range your rendezvous. Um, which is like a, once every four years, like everybody that was an is in Ranger Battalion goes and meets up. And last time, like e even a couple years ago for the second Ranger Battalion, like get together, uh, one of my buddies was like, dude, no one below the rank of E7 has combat experience. Like, do you, do you guys, do you guys get that? Like, yeah, sure. The good, pretty good training in Ranger Regiment, but like, that's fucking crazy. That's that's not that's not the military I I grew up in at all. So like that 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 has to be a consideration when going there's to. A, there's only so many YouTube videos that you can watch of training. <laughs> there's only so many room clearings. And at the end of the day, one thing that we both know from our training is once you cross that threshold, you're committed. Yeah, you're committed, and you're piling into that room no matter what. And in this case, the United States is crossing the threshold where its commitment level is going to have to be absolute. And again, once the genie is out of the bottle, you will not be able to bring it back in. And having that B2 on station, having 4,000 naval and marine personnel ready to go, supplying Israel with the weapons, intel, and armament to be able to prosecute what is essentially a war crime, while your economy is dying, you are flagrantly complicit in a genocide and you do not deserve to be in power leading our population or leading this great nation. And I, I think that the American population needs to remove the, the left-right paradigm for a while and start to look at this as the uni party for which it is, because there is direct alignment, whether you look at it left or right, Kamala or, or Trump, both of them are in full support of this genocide, both of them. 
So no matter how you, no matter how you vote, you're going to get the same person that's going to be responsible for managing the decline of the greatest nation on earth. So um, I, I just got a message because here, here, here comes the news cycle, uh, an article. Uh, real quick, and it'll pull it up. This is breaking kind of as of like an hour ago. So if you guys aren't tracking, the Cradle Media is is uh, one of the better English language um, uh, publications in the Middle East. They're plugged into all the resistance factions, and they're generally very correct. Um, so basically right now, um, this is the end of the news cycle in the Middle East because I think it's almost like uh, – 2 a.m. there. So uh, anyways, a Hezbollah source tells the cradle that Iran, Lebanon, and Yemen will launch simultaneous retaliatory strikes against Israel intended to overwhelm the Iron Dome. So that's one report um, ex uh, executing the unity of fronts. Uh, Yemen, uh, Ansar Allah says, we affirm our commitment to the battle, steadfastness, awareness, honor, and pride in standing with Palestine and the cause of the nation. So... Um, Let's see. I, I think there's a – let's see real quick. Um, let's see what the U.S. said because they also think I have a U.S. quote in here. Um, other well-informed sources agree that the response could be coordinated, suggesting that retaliation from multiple fronts simultaneously is likely. So – uh, senior U.S. military officials, meanwhile, have gone on the record cautioning that Washington would probably be unable to provide Tel Aviv with sufficient protection, even in a single front, full-scale war with Hezbollah. So from our perspective, based on where our forces are, the short range between Lebanon and Israel, it is harder for us to be able to support them, Israel, in the same way we did in April when Iran made its response from uh, the, the killing and the uh, assault on their embassy in Damascus. Now, I, I do think this is an interesting way of reestablishing deterrence, if this is actually what they're doing and not a, a targeted assassination, which would probably be more de-escalatory. But if, I kind of understand what they're doing right now because th they haven't shown that all these resistant factions can work together in a coordinated, complex operation to overwhelm the Iron Dome, the David uh, Sling, and the Arrow 2 system. If they could see that, I, I think it would be sent up. Like, even if it doesn't do a catastrophic amount of damage, I think that would be a really significant deterrent for the Israeli people. They will feel very under siege. So it, it does kind of make sense. The psychological, the psychological impact of that, of knowing that the so-called alarms that go off, the so-called Iron Dome that, that catches... Um, these typical rocket threats to have that that halo essentially crushed and reality be brought to your doorstep. It, you would think that it would hope that they would call for an end to cessation of hostilities, but I don't think that they will. I think that you have a population that at a cultural level, at a media level, and even worse, at a religious level, has vehemently said over 90% of them said that they should continue prosecuting this war. So I don't necessarily know if the strike by Iran is going to bring them to Bibi's doorstep to end the war. I think that it's going to actually embolden them and say, have Bibi say, you see, guys, I told you, if it's not for me, who else is going to defend you? We have to go to war. And oh, by the way, we have the Sansom option. That we need to probably uh, that we need to take hold of, because by all costs Israel must survive, right. void of any other nation. And this is why the B two landing in Al Udeid is such a problem, because they will use. And again, it's not my opinion, and it's really not up for debate. Israel has shown the capability to influence and control United States kinetic and foreign policy to achieve its foreign policy goals. And I say that they will use that kinetic response on Iran to show the level of force and deterrence that they think that it will lead, that it will give them. But I don't think that it's going to actually work. I think that's what they believe it will happen. But, you know, what you believe is just fairy dust and pixie, and pixie dust. What's actually going to happen is that the region will embolden itself and they will align. And you will face a massive guerrilla campaign 
on all fronts, north, south, and west of you, or in the east of you, I should say. And Israel cannot defend that. It's not because Israel's weak. It's not because they're not a great army, which they're not, but it's simply because no standing army would be able to defeat that. It would be massively impossible. It, it, it just, it's just going to be. 20% of your population is Arab. If 20% of your population is Arab, how many of those are going to defect and start doing internal attacks? How are you yeah. going to defend all of your borders? And here, it's, here's it's a, not possible. Yeah, it's it's not possible. Also, something we have to keep in mind that a lot of these fighters are from countries that have been bombed for the past 20 years. They have they have a much higher tolerance for discomfort and pain than your average Tel Avivian citizen. And so um I, I do think that the psychological impact is going to be significant. Also, uh, Iran is engaged in its own like uh, propaganda, psychological information operations. I just got sent this video. It's Iran's response. It's Iran's pre-attack response video that came out a couple hours ago. Um, and they're showing their uh, hypersonic ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Okay, well, uh, a lot of uh, 1990s, mid-90s X-Files cinematography going on yeah. there with the super imposition of, like, the clock and the and the video effects. But um, they do have a very significant arsenal. And when they – it's important to re uh, recognize that in April, they weren't shooting their Cadillac ship. They're, they're shooting uh, stockpiles from, like, the 90s. They Like, not, not any of the weapons that they have been uh, developing – uh, at the after the turn of the century, so um, uh, I just want to circle back. Yeah, what is the uh, is Israeli uh, tolerance, the dual citizens tolerance for sustaining this kind of war? Also, like they would be displaced from Israel for years, um, and then they they would start lives somewhere else. And would they come back? Probably a lot of them wouldn't. So um, you're, you're looking at a major depopulation crisis as well. For the people who have never been to uh, Israel, um, Tel Aviv is very much like New York City. It is very much like any built-up urban city. Um, they don't face internet out outages. There is no, oh, the water's turned off today. It is an incredibly modern city. It's like San Francisco, New York, um, L.A., however you want to call it, whatever city you want to pick, Austin. It is built up. Their infrastructure is pristine. And... They are not used to, like you said, living hand to mouth. They enjoy a very good quality of life, the best in the Middle East. When you remove internet, when you remove infrastructure, when you remove the capability of freedom of mobility because of uh, massive security concerns, it starts to wear on the population. And the population inverts on itself a lot of the times. You already see it now just in the, in the hostage negotiations where almost a million Israelis were brought out into the street to protest against Bibi. So though I said before that I think that it will further embolden them with an Iranian strike, I don't know how long that level of cohesion will last before the population says enough is enough that we need to bring an end to this because there is no good outcome here. You're only dealing with bad and worse. Like there's there's no what's the best choice. There is you're going to pick a bad choice and you're going to eat this shit sandwich no matter what. Yeah. And when we talk about societal cohesion, will it survive a, 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 a sustained war of like bombing or attrition or rocket attacks or um, yeah, what I've always said is something like apartheid. Like if you're actually living in apartheid, you need to have your entitlement and your privileges so that you can 
absorb that cognitive dissonance and yep. be like, yeah, you know, I have free healthcare though. It's really affordable housing. We have to have a great life. You know, if, if, if they, if they lose that standard of living, I do feel like a lot of people are going to start questioning like, Oh, maybe this is apartheid. Maybe this is wrong. Again, so. when you are now going to be faced with the checkpoints that you have uh, forced other Palestinians to deal with, and you can't go enjoy your, your nightlife that you so very much enjoy when you're no longer able to do these things, it will cause you to say, okay, maybe my government is wrong to a certain extent. But the problem that becomes is how long will it take for it to lead to that? And what are the catastrophic consequences during that lead up that you're going to have to bear and who is going to have to bear them also? Because let's not forget, whether we like it or not, there's an ongoing genocide that's going on in Gaza that will further bleed over into the West Bank even more than it has been. Again, over 150 people have been killed in the West Bank since this has started. There have been over 5,000 people that have been detained indefinitely in the West Bank. So this will not end well for, for the people in the West Bank. And let's not forget something. It didn't take an actual genocide to get these other nations to come to the aid of the Palestinians. Their retort or their kinetic response to Israel is because Israel attacked them. They were going to very well let this genocide continue. Very well. Because again, if, if over 100,000 people killed couldn't bring you to action, it takes Israel lashing out the way that it has in order to bring you to, to, to action. Well, if that's the case, that would mean that there's going to be a multiplier effect of Palestinians that are killed and detained in those territories. It's just math at this point. That's not, an, that's not an opinion. Israel will further lash out against those people. Well, both internally and externally, because they're, they're, they're in an impossible position, because like how, how do they extricate themselves at this point? How do they, even if they wanted to, which they don't, which most people in the government don't, de-escalate? Because right now, as of today, another bombshell report, um, apparently only three of the 24 Hamas battalions are destroyed or combat ineffective completely, as reported by CNN, citing data compiled by the Critical Threats Project and the Institute for the Study of War, which is actually a generally pretty well-regarded uh, combat think tank. So like we've been saying since October, conscripts and bombing campaigns don't work. I mean, there when we say that there are still 21 active Hamas battalions, that probably is a blanket statement for like Palestinian Islamic Jihad and other forces as well. And yes, some of those uh, battalions may be only able to perform sporadic operations, like planting a couple IEDs here and there. Uh, but they're still active and they're still recruiting and replenishing their numbers. Israel doesn't have enough time to complete the genocide. And also, Smotrich, their far-right finance minister, has said today that they couldn't, even if they wanted to, even if it was justified, which, of course, he asserts it is, but he says they can't do it. They have to give them humanitarian aid because the international pressure is mounting too much. So how do they get out of it? This is why we've been talking about a regional war since December. Like, I, I don't see how else they do it. Like, how, how does this it's, regime last? It's the threshold that I told you. Once you cross that threshold, you're committed and you can't go back. And they have reached that point. And, you, and again, it's not my opinion. BB is literally saying it in his own words. He is not planning to de-escalate. He came to the Congress and he specifically told them, we are planning for a larger regional war. And through total complicity and corruption, Lindsey Graham institutes a war powers resolution. Oh, for, kin Jesus. For, for kinetic action. So this is not, we don't have to guess. This is the best part of the narcissist. The narcissist tells you what he's going to do. Shame on us if we don't believe him. He has said, this is not my geopolitical analysis. This is not yours. And it's not up for either one of our opinions. The man who's pulling the trigger has said what he is going to do. He is planning and plans to fully prosecute a larger regional war. And he is telling you, I'm going for Lebanon. He's been telling you that for the past six, seven months as he's been bombing them indiscriminately. Or, excuse me, precisely with meticulous targeted attacks, 
showing that he actually could have done this in Gaza, but chose not to. But the fundamental problem for him that he is going to face is one of logistics. Because you can have all the F-22 fighters that you want. If you don't have the bombs to equip them, what good are they? Oh, uh, that, that freaking uh, global uh, RDX and H, uh, HMX supply chain shortage is really biting them in the ass right now. You know, um, we, there, there just isn't enough bombs and munitions to go around right now. The Ukrainians are shooting freaking uh, during certain parts of the year, 10,000, 155 shells a day. Then Israel drops 80,000 bombs at least. That's just what we know on Gaza Strip. Like we're into our own stockpiles that we need to maintain for our own deterrence against like other major powers. And we're giving it to Israel. Like this is why their bombing has stopped. It's not because they essentially uh, that uh, has gone down in intensity and tempo. It's not because they have decided, oh, maybe we should go soft on Hamas now. No, uh, they, they literally have to ration their bombs. And they were talking about this in Haaretz where veteran intelli or intelligence veterans were telling Haaretz, it's like, yes, the reason we've seen um, a drawdown in operational uh, close air support operations is because we've got to ration it now. And so if, if you don't even have enough to bomb Gaza, like how, how do you have enough ordinance to support deterrence against multiple different fronts in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq? Um, it, let's not forget, you, you, it's, it's not just the ordinance you're going to need. You're going to need a full spectrum of logistics. You're going to need the JP-8 that, or, or that takes your tanks and your APCs and your planes to fly. You're going to need the maintenance for that. Yeah. Oh, just so you're you guys gonna, know, JP-8, JP-8 is fuel, aircraft fuel. You're, you're going to need all of those aspects. And at some point in time, you know, the logistics train, it breaks down. And it's already shown to be breaking down. Again, like you said, their bombing campaign has deteriorated, not because, they, not because they're benevolent, but because they're actually starting to say, okay, if we do plan to prosecute this war, well, we're going to start to have, we're going to have to start rationing so, uh, our weapons because Hezbollah, when I start striking them, again, 10,000 missiles in Hezbollah alone. Again, it's way more than that. 10,000 missiles launching at Israel is okay. massively, it, yeah. it is devastating. It is devastating. The Iron Dome, there are not enough Iron Dome batteries scattered around Israel to protect it against that. There just are not. They have missiles that can hit Tel Aviv. Again, Tel Aviv being in the central center point of Israel. They have that full capability. The fact that the United States is sending a U.S. naval carrier there, guess where that naval carrier is not going to go? It is not going anywhere near the port of Haifa because it, Haifa will be the first place to go because Hezbollah, if they're smart, which they are, they know the logistics offload is going to come from Haifa. They know for a fact there's only so much that a C-5 can carry, C-5 being a cargo plane, there's only so much that a C-5 can carry before, you know, it, it's just a drop in the bucket. So the first thing that they'll eliminate is the port of Haifa. The United States will not lose a naval carrier for, for the sake of Israel. That, that just won't happen. That just yeah, will not agreed. happen. Agreed. Agreed. So then you have the threat from the Houthis who will launch a simultaneous protracted war directly at the naval assets of the United States, risking our sons and daughters' lives for the at the behest of a rogue nation. This is not something that we can win. And just because this is not something where we say, you know what, we're going to we're not going to quit no matter what. It is stupid to be fighting this war. Our economy is suffering. Our people are suffering. And we are willing to say, damn them all. Let's just support Israel, who doesn't care one iota about any American. They, Greg, last time I was in Iraq, I never saw one IDF soldier. I don't know what deployments you've been on. I've never seen them anywhere around the world that I've been, ever. Yeah, I, not, I never not once. I never saw them in Afghanistan. The only time I saw them was on leave in Budapest one year, and they were uh, uh, they were douchebags. You know, let's just say that. So, yeah. So <laughs> again, they are they are they're not prepared for the consequences, and. The, and if there's a matter of energy that you put forward, 
preparing for this is not something that I would do. You ha- there is a strategic level of power that's involved in diplomacy. And we are sacrificing that for the sake of corporations who are going to produce bombs to drop on the heads of fucking kids. And I find that to be unconscionable. And at a certain point in time, we can no longer lobby our Congress. We need to go directly to the doorstep of the people on the board of Lockheed, of the board of Raytheon. And we need to be at their doorsteps because this is literally destroying the United States from within. You know, we should uh, we, we should in, in the future do a whole episode on uh, protest and direct action techniques because going going to the board members, ooh, they won't like that. They, Again, won't, they won't they won't like these, their little. These people are cowards, Greg. They've yeah. never seen the whites of a man's eyes go black. They are cowards. Once one, two, three, four, five of them feel the consequence, the rest will fall in line. I guarantee you. Guarantee I. I I'm not a gambling man, but I'm willing to bet anything and everything I have because this is what it's going to take. And this is actually what their actions are bringing us to. Because for every dollar that we spend on defense spending, it's a dollar that we lose on the investment that's causing an American to die in the middle of the street. And that's treasonous, period. It is treasonous. (sighs) Yeah, well, you know, it, it does seem that escalation is inevitable. Um, I, I, I guess I wouldn't like to take bets on is this going to get out of control? Because to circle back at the beginning, um, definitely established, and there's been a precedent set since October of escalation management, not just between the United States and Iran. Hezbollah has done escalation management with Israel, applying military pressure while not hitting anything significant enough where they have to bomb, in the in the words of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in January, quote, turn Beirut into Gaza. So there's been a lot that that going on. But, you know, if we look at history, um, the dimensions of a conflict can get out of control really fast. And so when, when, when we talk about the B-2 bomber, it's like they're in the 4,000 Marines and amphibs off, off, uh, off the coast of like in the Gulf and then a, a unit like Ranger Regiment that I was in that could get stood up to like start doing uh, like high value target kill capture raids at, um, and go kinetic real within 72 hours. It's like this can get really out of hand really fucking fast. Sure. But so there's the capability and then there's the feasibility, right? Sure. Yeah. The, ca- the capability is there, but the feasibility is another thing. No mm-hmm. plan survives first contact. You and I both yeah. know that. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, whether you call whether you call the the first mew, whether you call a second ranger battalion, if them landing in Beirut, at a certain point in time, you start engaging in insurgent math. You kill three, twelve will spawn up. Mm-hmm. You kill twelve, twenty four. This is a fundamental compound interest equation. You can see what that has yielded us in Gaza. You killed potentially, in their words, ten thousand. Hamas fighters, look at what has stood up. Hamas has swelled its ranks. And those men that pulled their kids from underneath burning buildings with their skulls crushed, you're not going to be able to tell them, hey, let's just calm down. They want their pound of flesh, and they Mm -hmm. rightly will deserve it. And you're not going to be able to put that toothpaste back in the bottle. This has reached a point where there is no turning back. They, they have reached this escalation point. And I think that Bibi knows it. And this is why he's pushing forward with this. Because he, whether he wants to or not, they're not going to stop. If Israel pulled out of Gaza today, if Israel pulled out of the West Bank today, that would not stop the Palestinians. Mm-hmm. Greg, it is, it's mm-hmm. fundamentally simple and it's just carnal. I'm a dad. You might not be a dad but let me go ahead and kill your mom, your sister, your dad. Let me kill one of them and let's see how you react with all the training that you have. I wouldn't have a place on this earth. I'd be safe because you'd come and get me rightfully. So that's the same thing with a lot of the Israelis and the IDF soldiers, those Palestinians who have pulled and watched their family members die from underneath the rubble. 
They want their justice. They want their, it's universal. It's the language of justice does not speak a specific dialect. It is universal in its application and they are going to exact their justice. Yeah, you know, what I what I try to tell to some vets who are just like, bro, they're terrorists. It's like, dude, you were a fucking white dude growing up in Texas. Like, nobody was trying to take shit from you. Still, you fucking volunteered for, like, Marine infantry or, like, fucking rangers or goddamn SEALs, uh, knowing you're going to get go into the shit. And so, like, what if you were born in Gaza? Would, would you be cool based off of you who I did, like, four combat deployments with, and you're a psycho, would you just be like, you know what? They killed my brother and, you know, assaulted my sister, but I'm just going to be a baker. I'm going to bake things. It's it's like the most insane double standard, and it works because of, like, obviously racism and, you know, sure. constructed Islamophobia, so you don't see them as the similar humans to you. Of course not. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, so th there is this, before we end, there's been this like wider idea as like the Middle East conflict. Peace in the Middle East is never going to be changed until there's like a regional war to like burn down the jungle and like build it all up again. And I, I've been seeing this because I because I monitor uh, X just to see what the freaking Nazis are saying because like X is like so full of freaking right wing people um, that are just war hawks. Uh, so there, there's a massive contingent contingent pushing for it. And escalation is inevitable. I guess, you know, I stopped trying to make hard and fast geopolitical predictions in about f at February because um, you, it's based off rationality and precedent. And we're just not seeing a lot of either. Like we're in unprecedented uh, territory in terms of like what's actually unfolding in the Middle East right now. And um, rationality, it's hard to say that when you're dealing with a couple with a rogue actor. So um, I guess to end like what what your thoughts um i don't know just just any closing thoughts because i'm just like what the fuck at this point i um, mean i think it's important for us to like i said before listen to our enemy there mm -hmm. he's very clear in what he's going to do he tells that we have the beauty he is going to do exactly what he says we know what corrupt people do we know how the Congress is going to act. You can see it in Lindsey Graham's actions. You can see it in uh, the potential VP pick of Josh Shapiro in their statements. Kamala Harris is very well willing to fund a genocide. You, again, they have told us what they plan to do. They have had the opportunity <laughs> to stop this. They have not taken that opportunity. So that should tell you that they very well want to continue this. And they will. They fundamentally will. So I think it's important for us to listen to them and not have wishful thinking or engage in wishful thinking where we say, you know what, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. No. The United States was very willing to kill over a million Iraqis, all right, in, in the GWAT. They were very willing to kill over half a million Afghanis, okay? They displaced over five million in the region proper. I think that we should listen to them when... All of the facts line up. They have deployed 4,000 U.S. service members in risks of their life. They have deployed a strategic nuclear bomber, potentially, with a nuclear armed payload into the region. They have for over 15 years said that they need to conduct a nuclear strike on Iran. Every single bit of what they have said that they wanted to do, they are doing. Again, the General uh, Wesley Clark, the clean, break, the, clean, the clean break policy that he spoke about, all of this is coming to fruition. The only thing that they were wrong about was their timeline. It took them a little bit longer than what they said. Shame on us if we don't listen to them. Shame on us if we don't follow exactly what we see in front of our eyes. Because this isn't a situation where even salt looks like sugar. This is very much, they have said what they're going to do. You better fucking believe them. And they're doing it. So the question now is, what are we going to do in order to mobilize to stop it? My, my action that I take, we have this community that we're forming. And I just personally refuse under any circumstances to vote for Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, period. I will not vote for them. I don't care if I have to do third party. They will not get my vote. And anybody who has any inkling of moral fortitude 
who says that they would vote for Kamala Harris, but at the same time says that a genocide is bad, you are complicit in this genocide. Fundamentally simple. Doesn't mean that you have a binary option in selecting Trump, but it does mm -hmm. mean that you should figure out a third party vote and, and give your vote to that. Because at the end of the day, the third party only needs to reach 34% in order to win. That's if you believe in the charade of the popular vote. Yeah, you know, we uh, might have to have our little own a hard reset of the system here eventually. Um, yeah. But we're, we're not there yet. We're still trying to educate, spread awareness. And basically, um, the past nine, ten months have been a crash course in waking people up. So it, it's what I it's what I call the uh, the Palestine phenomena, uh, where you saw how horrible our government's policy was in the face of the genocide, and then you start being like, "Huh, what's the war in Ukraine about? Huh, what was the global war on terror about? Huh, what's up with the carceral system? What's up with these cops? You know, because um, it, it's all all connected." I mean, we also have to remember something very key and crucial: the education that you and I both have now is not the education that we had before. It's not the education that we had when we first joined. We actually believed in the forthrightness of the system. We actually believed that it was benevolent, just, and right. The difference is, I would like to say that you and I both say, we're going to take our skills that we learned, we're going to take the skills and in intensity, and we're going to apply it to try to do good, even if it's one drop that we put into the bucket. Over mm -hmm. time, we hope to get a gallon of goodness that everybody can drink from. So I think it's important for us to understand that the people that we're going to talk to to the people that are listening, though your views might be different, remember where you came from and remember that the people that you're talking to have been under have been undertaken under a, a system of mass manipulation. They are inundated every single day at a social level, in their community circles, at a media level. They are indoctrinated and it does not get that that indoctrination does not break overnight. It takes time. So have some grace. Talk to them politely. Talk to them like a three-year-old. Don't patronize them. Don't condescend them. Just say, listen, we don't agree today, but just start thinking about this. Or take a look at this. Send a text message. Send a video here or there. You'll see within, within three months, four months, people start to change their perception. Yeah, and that's a great point. I mean, look, we can't, we can't de-escalate the Middle East right now. We can't stop a bunch of proxy wars and coups and other things, but we can educate people about the system yeah. going forward. So we're not powerless. We're just, it just, these things just take time. So, um, yep. Uh, we, we might do another episode if this thing kicks off in the next 24 or 48 hours. We'd love you to hop on for that. Uh, hopefully it doesn't. So, um, thank you so much for coming on again, man. And we hope to see you next time. Thanks y'all for listening. Um, I think we're going to talk, tackle, try and tackle the contentious and very controversial Venezuelan uh, uh, elections on the next episode. But that's all news cycle dependent. And thank you all for watching. We hope to see you next time on Colonial Outcasts. We have more content on Patreon if you're interested, but I'm too exhausted by the world to do that plug right now. So again, thanks, man, for coming on, and we'll see you next time. Take care.